afternoon, everyone. Once again, I would like to welcome you all to our event uh, on Kirkuk today. We are very pleased and honored to be hosting Dr. Najmaldin Kerim, who is uh, the governor of Kirkuk province since 2011. Uh, we'll be talking about Kirkuk. It's a very timely event. Uh, there was sad news from Kirkuk yesterday. There was a, a suicide bombing attack uh, that killed several. Uh, I believe it was Tuesday. Um, and Kirkuk is, is a very important province that has long been considered um, identified as the center of political and ethnic tensions in Iraq. And it, it's also central to several other sets of conflicts. And some consider and argue that, that Kirkuk has the potential to uh, make or break national reconciliation efforts between different ethnic groups um, in Iraq. And it's also central to the fight against the Islamic State. So Dr. Karim has a very challenging job, and we all look forward to what you have to say, sir. And uh, thanks for being with us today. And without further ado, I would like to turn, it, turn the floor over to Dr. Karim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Middle East Institute. It's not strange to me. I used to come here before I was a governor or had any official position. And it's great to see some old friends. David Mack, Phoebe Marr, other friends. Ahmed is here. Many of you I have met before. Uh, with Ambassador Mack, uh, we go back a long way, actually, 1991. Uh, the, after the uh, first Gulf War. And I used to go to the State Department. At that time, there was no KRG, no KDP office, no PUK office. I remember one day I was in the operating room, honestly. I don't know if you remember or not. I was in the operating room at the Washington Hospital Center. A uh, lady with a big tumor, actually. Uh, and I got a call. They say the State Department uh, uh, is on the line. Uh, there was a phone there, so I took my gloves off and took the phone, and they said it was Ambassador Mack's office. And uh, I said, okay, I'm doing surgery now, but I will finish, and I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I did finish the surgery, talked to the family, patient was awake, and then I went to the State Department. It was the time when they had a problem in Zahwa between the Peshmerga forces and the Iraqi liaison. You know, at that time, they were trying to create the safe haven. But that was a long time ago. Uh, uh, I want to start with what happened yesterday, uh, uh, just briefly to, uh, I know it's in the news, and uh, we lost some uh, brave police officers and some uh, civilians. Uh, it was uh, two suicide bombers. They were able to get in, and uh, Kirkuk has been so safe. Uh, this is in the city, a uh, small town called Dibis. Uh, Kirkuk has been so safe. I think there was some relaxation, some laxity with our uh, security forces. You know, nothing has happened for over a year, actually. Uh, so they, if they were more alert, probably this wouldn't have happened, or it would have happened with less uh, damage and casualties. But um, uh, you know, suicide, when somebody decides to die, it's very hard to locate them and find them before that happens. We have done it occasionally, uh, but you can't always prevent those, uh, uh, you know, those, uh, I mean, the guy wants to die, and whoever he kills with themselves, uh, they do it. Uh, uh, but overall, the situation in Kirkuk is really safe in the city. Uh, we haven't had any major incident, you know, uh, for a long time, and uh, the city has over 500,000 uh, internally displaced people, and Ahmed was there not long ago, uh, and Kirkuk has been able to host those people without any major problem. We are sharing our uh, electricity, our water, our schools, our medicine, uh, everything with them, and we are getting almost zero help from Baghdad with these IDPs. Very little help from the UN. It's the generosity of the people of Kirkuk that has really kept the place safe and these uh, IDPs to feel like at least they have a home. Uh, 
They, have, they haven't been received anywhere else in Iraq. You have heard about Baghdad and the bridge when people of Ramadi was tried to go in other places in Mosul. But in Kirkuk, uh, uh, I mean, if, if you talk to them, the place they have been received the best has been in Kirkuk. Uh, which is which is a testament to the goodness of the people there, actually. Uh, <clears throat> I think being in the Middle East Institute, it's it's proper just to remember uh, uh, a friend of ours, most of you know, uh, regardless of what you think of him. I think the passing of our friend Ahmad Chalabi was uh, something very sad for me personally because he has been a friend. He was a brave person. Uh, uh, take politics aside, we agreed with him at that time on everything. Uh, then Monday night or Monday quarterbacking is always is is always there sometimes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but it was a sad thing. I think he was a good person. He was very brave, uh, and he was really working hard in the parliament as uh, chairman of the finance committee. Uh, as far as reforms, and uh, he was very bright. You may all know that. Uh, <clears throat> well, let me uh, start with uh, Kirkuk. Uh, you mentioned a point uh, uh, that uh, where Kirkuk goes, there goes Iraq. Uh, Kirkuk, in a, in a way, is special. Uh, Kirkuk is uh, a mixture of ethnicities, sects, religions. Uh, and when I went back in 2011, uh, well, in 2010 and then in 2011, I became governor. Before that, I was a member of parliament for about six or eight months. Uh, I really had a feeling that the Kirkuk I left in the early 70s uh, has changed. Uh, I have seen people going to Kirkuk, visiting there for a day, or sometimes from outside writing reports about Kirkuk, that Kirkuk is this time bomb, and it will explode any time. And if that happens, all Iraq will go down the drain. Uh, but the reality was not that, which made my job much easier, despite the difficulties and, and problems we had. Actually. Uh, when I went back starting with the uh, campaign process for the parliament early 2010, uh, I could go to the bazaar, to the uh, outside, to different places, and you could see a Kurd and a Turkoman, they are partners. They have a shop, they work together. Uh, you see an Arab and a Turkoman, an Arab and a Kurd. And actually, you don't see that tension among the people. Everyday working person, you don't have that tension. And you also don't have, uh, you could see also a lot of intermarriages. I mean, much more than I thought, really. Uh, and I come to realize it's really a group of politicians. They just make you know, uh, issues out of something that doesn't exist, actually. And if you come to Kirkuk, you realize that. And I honestly tell you, if there are probably less than a dozen number of people. If you just take these people and just shut their mouth, you will not hear all these bad and terrible things about Kirkuk. Because the people do really get along together. And that's, when, once I saw that, I, I, like I said, it made my job easier. Instead of focusing on politics, Kirkuk is Kurdistan, Kirkuk is not Kurdistan, Kirkuk should be in KRG or not, it, or this and that. Focus on services. Services unite the people. And, and that's what we did. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, uh, we started building schools. Uh, we started building roads. We improved our electricity, actually, from two to four hours a day to the best electricity in all of Iraq. Actually, it was so good that Minister of Electricity, the new one, tried to cut down on our supply and because he said, you have a lot of electricity, others don't have it. I said, well, we're paying for it. It's not uh, uh, something that you're giving it for free. We are getting just our share from Baghdad. I think this helped the people to really calm the people down. 
uh, a lot of jobs were created. A laborer was making ten to ten, uh, nine to ten thousand dinars a day. Before this economic crisis and the ISIS thing, actually you couldn't get a laborer for thirty-five thousand dinars a day. It was it was and and people would come from Romadi, from Mosul, from other places to work in Kirkuk because we had so many projects, uh, and that showed up. You know the people appreciate uh, work that showed up in the elections for the parliament in two thousand fourteen. Uh, uh, when the people voted. It was the first time since 2003 that Arabs and Turkmen voted for somebody who is not their ethnicity, actually. And, and that happened. You know, people are smarter. They see, they see, if they see good work, they reward you. They see bad work, they tell you you're doing something bad. And, and that really created a very much less tense situation, uh, and it was helpful. And then we had issues with Baghdad. In 2012, uh, Prime Minister Maliki decided to create uh, Tigris Operation Commands, uh, which meant that everything in, that included Kirkuk, which meant that everything will be under his control or the military's control, including the police, administration, everybody. Uh, you know, other provinces in uh, Mosul, in Tikrit in Ramadi, Diyala, those places, they accepted this. We refused. We refused the army to come to the city uh, because we thought army doesn't belong to the city. Police belongs to the city. And there was big issues with him. Uh, but we refused, and they never came. Uh, they threatened. They did different things. And I have to say that uh, President Talabani was at that time in Germany getting treatments, and I was in constant conversation with him, and he was very supportive of our decision. Because we saw that these operation commands, whether it was in Bakuba or in Mosul or in Tikrit, didn't do any good, or in Baghdad. There were explosions every day. There was chaos every day, and nothing was happening. So uh, uh, then we started doing some other things in Kirkuk. We started to bring, build a trench around the city, 58 kilometers, two meters deep, three meters wide. So there will be only one access into the city. And that really helped cut down on car bombs and other things significantly. And then we moved fast forward to, uh, oh, the other thing we did was uh, we moved police headquarters that was in the middle of the city, in the middle of shops and everything that was target of terrorists and explosives there. And uh, we moved them in the, into the airport. Baghdad objected. Uh, actually, I might. Uh, Tell you, we even had some friends from here who were in the, at the embassy. They said, well, this is property of Ministry of Defense. He says, yeah, but it's property of Kirkuk. Uh, so we, we will do it. And we did it. And actually, that, since that, they know nothing has happened that was related to police headquarters in, in the city. And there were many other uh, measures that we took to protect our people. And the protection was not for one ethnic group or one sector. It was for everybody. Then comes June 8, 2014. ISIS comes, takes over Western or Western Bank of Mosul, especially the northern part of it. Uh, I talked to the governor. Uh, he was not happy because the army was bombing those areas, and apparently uh, there were houses and inhabited by people. Well, on the 10th, uh, we got the news in the morning that ISIS has taken all over Mosul. Uh, I uh, called the 12th Division commander of the Iraqi army. He came uh, to my office. I said, what are your plans? He said, we're going to reinforce our uh, units in a place called uh, Tal al warid which is uh, west of Kirkuk. Uh, but they had given up on Hawija already, and ISIS wasn't even near there. Actually, the places that were taken by ISIS in Kirkuk were all under the protection of the army. These were rural areas. And 36 hours after the army left the place, then ISIS showed up, few people with taxis, you know, riding in a taxi, showed up in a town called Abbasi. Ahmed knows where that is. <coughs> and uh, uh, they took over. So uh, I called the 
commander at four o'clock. I said, where are you? He said, I'm at Tal al -Warid. And then I found out he was not actually, he was at K1, which was the headquarters of the 12th division. By midnight, I got in touch with him. He said, well, everything is finished. They are looting the place. They are taking everything, you know, people and whoever in that area, they are looting the headquarters of the, uh, of the army. Uh, I sent for him the next day. He came with six other officers. He says, these are the best officers of the Iraqi army. Uh, everything was finished. We got him severely enclosed. I made arrangements for him to go to, uh, to fly to Baghdad from Soleimani Airport. Uh, that was as much as the Iraqi army did the 12th Division. And, and the reason I mentioned the Operation Command, had we allowed the Iraqi army to come into the city of Kirkuk, the fate of Kirkuk would have been exactly the same as Mosul, as Ramadi, as, as Tikrit, as, as those places. That's really what saved Kirkuk. Today, uh, Kirkuk is protected by Peshmerga. Uh, the Peshmerga uh, has paid heavy prices. We had good commanders, uh, you know, paid, lost their lives uh, protecting the city. Uh, like I said, uh, they had to deal with flood of uh, IDPs come in, at the meantime, defending against ISIS. Uh, the situation was very dangerous uh, at the beginning. And then ISIS had a major offensive in October of last year. It was repulsed by the Peshmerga forces. They made some advances initially, but it was retaken. Uh, and in that battle, we lost some brave Peshmerga forces. We even lost police, actually, even our police uh, the rural uh, uh, rural area police also participated with them. Uh, the major offensive by ISIS was in January of this year, January 30th and 31st. And they, you know, organized a big force, and their uh, plan was to take over the electrical uh, uh, grids, uh, take over the uh, gas uh, storage areas, and take over the oil fields. Uh, with the help of the coalition forces uh, and the Peshmergas. And even then, they made progress. They attacked from six, fr six prongs. And from five of them, they were able to advance a little bit. Peshmergas regrouped with the, with the uh, airstrikes. Uh, they were uh, able to defeat them. And actually, they lost more than 400 people. I think after that, they have never recovered. ISIS has not. After that... Uh, Attack. I think you were there, uh, Michael. It, one of them, I don't know which one. Was it October or the January? Yeah, the second one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I have an album with the pictures of uh, dead ISIS. They were littered all over the place, actually. I mean, if you went there, you just see them thrown there. We arranged for them to, to be uh, taken to forensic medicine and they had no names, of course, but they were given numbers and they were buried uh, properly. Uh, uh, today, uh, ISIS is driven further apart to the point that uh, uh, to the point that the artillery and uh, other means that they used to bombard. Uh, sometimes they can reach those vital uh, structures, but not accurately because it, they're, they're driven uh, far away. The only place that uh, still has ISIS in it that's close to a city called, uh, a town called Taza, is a village called Bashir. These are Turkmen, uh, Shia Turkmens. Uh, and uh, that probably would have been uh, finished as well, liberated. Uh, but there's a conflict here because uh, they have Shia militias, even though they are local. Turkmen's really, we, we, say, we, we said that many times. But the US is reluctant to have Air Force involved uh, when, there are, when there are Shia militias. So that's the only place. Otherwise, they have been driven apart. The situation now is you have uh, Iraqi government forces and Shia forces coming from uh, south through Tikrit to come to Hawija area. That's the border between Kirkuk and uh, Salah Adin province. Uh, initially, it, so, it was thought that they made some progress, but they really have stopped. This is about two weeks. 
so Hawija uh, and some sub-districts around it, Abbasi, Rashad, and uh, Riyadh, they are still controlled by Daesh. And most of the people who are fighting for them are local people. They're not foreigners. They're Iraqis, and most, most of them are local. They are from the towns we know, and they have recruited a lot of young people. They have recruited a lot of young people. Uh, <clears throat> I, they may have had some foreigners, uh, uh, but very few. They are mostly locals. We know even their leader, who they are. Uh, so this is, it's a myth that this was uh, all people from France or from Chechnya or from these places, Dagestan and coming. Uh, may, they may be in Syria, but not in Iraq. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, <clears throat> our relationship with Baghdad. <clears throat> Kirkuk is administratively connected with Baghdad. People get their salaries from Baghdad. Uh, but Baghdad still believes in strong central government. The prime minister says he wants to delegate authorities according to the law that was passed in 2013 to delegate authorities to the governor, governorates uh, from eight ministries. But each minister that comes there, they think they are ministers forever, so they will not accept it. They, they put forward blocks, they will uh, prevent this from happening, and that has created a lot of tension between governorates, including ours, and Baghdad. Uh, that's why you see Basra asking to become a region by itself. That's why other places, they want to uh, uh, disconnect with Baghdad. I, and, and this is an important uh, point to mention, because unless Baghdad really believes in uh, decentralization, federalism, and delegating what is done best by the governorates to them, I think, uh, Iraq will not have a future unless, unless that happens. And that is uh, the crux of the problem between KRG and Baghdad as well. Uh, I don't say KRG is, has zero faults. Obviously, there is some faults there. Uh, but it's all, uh, uh, you know, ba the way Baghdad deals with everybody, and I'm not in the KRG. Kirkuk is not KRG. And we know how difficult it is. We haven't received any budget uh, for all 2015. We have received so far 26 billion Iraqi dinars, which is about $22 million for a, for a, a governor that uh, has a population of a million and a half plus 550,000 and over IDPs. This is, this is how it is. And I have seen the prime minister four times, and I've discussed with him. He understands it. Uh, but it looks like the economic uh, situation is so bad. Uh, there's no cash flow. And uh, when uh, I was uh, in Baghdad, I was talking to Mr. Chalabi. Uh, and uh, he deals with finance, and he knows all the numbers. And, and he really thought that you know, even the salaries cannot be continued if the situation continues like this. Uh, as far as the military situation is concerned, there has been progress in places like Tikrit, Salahadin province in Beji. Uh, Diyala has been declared free of ISIS a long time ago, I think probably seven or eight months, by Hadil Amri. Uh, but there are problems. The problems we have about 24,000 plus families from Diyala province, they are not allowed to return. They are not allowed to return. There's sectarian problems there. Uh, they want to return, but they are not allowed. Some problems happened in uh, Salahadin province, you know, when it was liberated. Uh, we have 53,000 plus families from Salahadin province. And to the date I came, I left there, less than uh, 22,000, uh, 2,200 families have gone back. So there is a re there's really a big problem. There is sometimes uh, ethnicity plays a role. You know, uh, the uh, Shia militias are, you know, not in some places they're not allowing 
people to return. It may be individual acts, but it's working. It's not allowing these people to go back. Uh, even in our areas, uh, in Kirkuk, in Erbil region, in some places, there has been individual uh, uh, acts that are not acceptable, you know. Uh, but we're trying to control that. I have been uh, personally on top of this because we don't see any reason. If somebody is ISIS, you just get them. Uh, but uh, collective punishment is unacceptable. Uh, no way we will accept that. Because uh, you know our people went through that. We know what Saddam did. We, we, can't, we can't do the same thing to other people. Uh, now the relationship between KRG and Baghdad. Uh, obviously, the tension between KRG and Baghdad has been going on really since 2003, since the beginning of uh, uh, the Constitution when it was uh, being written, and then and then after that, uh, it was mainly it's mainly about the oil, but there are other issues involved. Uh, in 2007, in February, there was an agreement uh, between the political parties uh, about. Uh, hydrocarbon law. Uh, and this was supposed to go to the parliament and be voted on. It never happened. But in it, there is a clause that each side can go ahead and do contract with oil companies and do this. So the KRG went and, according to this agreement, uh, invited companies, and you probably all know that. Uh, for a long time, uh, uh, the oil ministry uh, uh, Mr. Shahristani was uh, the minister, uh, said that uh, this is illegal. Uh, but there is, it is, there is a clause in that agreement that says that. Uh, well, Mr. Shahristani is no longer oil minister, but he is in that, uh, uh, they have a committee that involves him, oil minister, finance minister, the prime minister, of course, himself, and one other, uh, I think it's uh, planning ministry. These are the ones we decided. So in December of last year, a delegation from KRG went to Baghdad and they had an agreement. Uh, we complained to both of them because it was about Kirkuk and we thought we should be in it according to the Constitution, Article uh, one, uh, two, uh, uh, 211 and uh, uh, 212, that uh, the governors should be included. We complained, they both agreed that they should have invited us. Uh, in that agreement, uh, uh, KRG is to export 525,000 barrels with 300 from Kirkuk, the rest from KRG. Uh, and the only way to do that was through uh, pipelines going through Kurdistan regional region to, to Turkey because the other pipelines were all controlled by ISIS, uh, the old pipeline. Uh, what happened is... Uh, uh, the, there was also an understanding that until April, KRG cannot export that amount because the pipelines were not ready, you know, the diameter and other things. Uh, so by April, they were able to meet that amount. Uh, so ba KRG was expecting to get paid, you know, because now they are exporting that much. Well, uh, apparently Baghdad didn't uh, count it that way. So what they did, they counted from January until then, and they divided it by four or five months, so it, the, uh, the net is, is, is less than what uh, was agreed upon. And that's a problem between these two sides. Currently, all of Kirkuk's oil goes through the Kurdistan region uh, to Turkey. Uh, the proceeds from that is supposed to go to a bank in Turkey, and this, there's, Turkish government is part of, of this agreement. Uh, but that affects us, because... Uh, uh, Kirkuk is supposed to receive proceeds from uh, uh, any oil or gas that is produced. Uh, and uh, uh, regardless of who uh, exports that, uh, we have to get our share. So we, are, we don't have preference to put the blame on Baghdad only and absolve KRG or vice versa. Right? Uh, and that's why we have had some meetings with uh, officials in KRG, with the prime minister himself. and. Uh, and hopefully uh, Kirkuk's share will, uh, will be given uh, because that's vital to us because our, all our projects has stopped completely. Um, 
uh, currently, Kirkuk, we, uh, as you know, I'm uh, the governor. Uh, my deputy is an Arab, actually. He's acting governor now as I'm here with full powers. Uh, we had a uh, Turkoman as uh, uh, council chairman. Uh, he was elected to the parliament. He decided to leave. I was elected to the parliament as well, but I decided to stay. Uh, uh, because in the parliament, you really can't do anything. Whereas, you know, uh, if you have an executive job, you can do something. Uh, and uh, so that's why the place remains vacant, actually. Uh, they had uh, two, three, three, I think, uh, candidates from the Turkmen community. Uh, and that we're trying to help them to narrow it down to one person so uh, we can have the Turkmen as a chairman also, like uh, it was when I was... Uh, when I first started. Uh, yeah. In short, uh, Kirkuk is safe now. Kirkuk is protected by Peshmerga. The Peshmerga are not in the city. Peshmerga are only uh, in the fronts protecting the city. Uh, we have the police in the city with Asaish. Asaish are Kurdish security uh, forces. Uh, we have about a total of 4,000 Asaish. Our police numbers about 10,000. Uh, of those, 39% are Arab. 37% uh, uh, are Kurds. And I think 27, 28% are Turkmen's. We have few Christians there as well. Uh, which uh, uh, brings me uh, just to mention that in Kirkuk, the migration of Christians has been less than anywhere else uh, as far as you know, Baghdad, Basra, or Mosul is concerned. And of course, we have uh, regional powers interested in Kirkuk. Turkey is, Iran is. Uh, we have tried to keep uh, their uh, battles, their conflicts, their interests away from Kirkuk. When one side has tried to have something come to Kirkuk, and the other, we will just tell them, if you do this, then the other side will come. So we have kept everybody out of Kirkuk, and I think that's the key uh, to, uh, to the way it is. And, and even with, uh, when uh, Shia militias tried to come to Kirkuk, we told them, we, told them we uh, appreciate your efforts uh, against ISIS. Uh, you're fighting in too many places. In Kirkuk, we have forces that are protecting Kirkuk, and if we need any help, we will ask you. But thanks for asking. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Governor. And um, as the moderator, I would like to ask the first question, if I may, before opening the floor for questions from the audience. Um, Clearly, after the Islamic State captured Mosul, the, the dynamics have changed for, for Kirkuk. The Peshmerga is now protecting, um, is providing the security of Kirkuk. And uh, uh, the Kurdish forces, they expanded their territory around Kirkuk. So do you think, could this be problematic um, in, in the future? So could this, could Kirkuk become the, the flash point of, of conflict in, in the future? Thank you. No, I don't think so, because uh, uh, everybody actually, we're getting, uh, what are those areas occupied by ISIS now? It's, it's all Sunni Arab region. Actually, they are asking me every day, and I have very good relationship with them, when do the Peshmerga will go and, and liberate Hawija, liberate those places? Uh, and this is, this is uh, uh, the reality. So they like to get rid of ISIS because whoever goes there, and these people can go back to their homes. I mean, they are all IDPs. They don't have homes. They don't have income. They, don't, they have left everything behind. I don't think it's any problem. Uh, actually, they love the Peshmerga, and you see them. They go and visit them on the front lines. I mean, these are people paying their lives uh, with their lives to, uh, to get the enemy out. If it wasn't for, uh, uh, for the Peshmerga, ISIS will be in Kirkuk, and, and, and just like they have suffered, the Sunni Arabs have suffered in Mosul, in Ramadi, in Baquba, in every place they would be victims. By the way, everybody associates, uh, or I, I shouldn't say everybody, 
but there is some thought that ISIS is Sunni Arab. But in reality, the Sunni Arabs have suffered the most from ISIS than anybody else. You know, the Shia areas are protected pretty much. The Kurdish areas are pretty much protected. It's only the Sunni areas they have paid the biggest price. Even in Syria, look at the Alawite areas. You know, they have been pretty much safe so far uh, from this. So I don't think it is, uh, uh, it's a problem. Actually, the Peshmerg the Pers is a little bit reluctant to go further because uh, they need help. They, uh, you know, as far as ammunitions are concerned, weapons are concerned, uh, you know, protective gears, vehicles, and, and they lack a lot of things. It's, it's really the bravery and the love of land that's making them uh, go as far as they have. Thank you so much. Now I would like to open the floor for questions. Please um, identify yourselves and try to be brief, um, to be fair to others. So the gentleman over there. Oh, my God. White Knights Washington Institute. Great to see you, Governor. Um, Thank you. Uh, so asking about the uh, Sunni tribes that are being gathered together in places like Leyland and other areas around Kirkuk, Mahmur even. Um, Obviously, at a time when the Peshmerga are not getting fully paid or fully armed, it's difficult to think about giving arms, pay, equipment, training to other people, like Sunni tribes, let's say. But those IDPs are not going to go home unless those areas are reconquered, mostly by Sunni tribes, potentially. What do you think is going to be the future of that? You know, how do we get around the obstacles that are preventing us from setting up Sunni Hashid or Shabi units in... Uh, in the Kukuk area, and you know, is there any way you think that the Peshmerga could not lead the operation to take back Hawija, but maybe could support and embed and in some way help it forward? Okay. Mr. Governor, can we take one more question? Yes, yeah, sure. And then, so let's take one more. Uh... Hi. Um, Thanks, I wanted to ask what your reaction was to the political crisis in the KRG. Uh, what's your reaction? Uh, what, what crisis? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, your reaction to the expiration of President Barzani's oh, term okay. in office uh, okay. and the removal of Goran from uh, from the government, and has there been any impact for Kokuk? Yeah. Um, let me ask answer uh, Michael first. Uh, I think participation of the people from the areas that has been occupied by ISIS is critical to liberating these areas and then to keep it secure. Uh, that's why I say, you know, Peshmergas are reluctant to go to Hawija. Hawija, it's 100% Arabic speaking people. Peshmergas, unfortunately, this new generation, they don't speak other than Kurdish. Uh, so they will be strangers. They cannot even interact with the people. Uh, and, and for that reason, we actually, it's almost eight months, I invited some of the uh, Sunni Arabs from Zab, from Hawija, from uh, Rashad and those places uh, to see if we can form a force for them so they can participate with the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga can help them, but they can be the leading force. And we did collect about seven or 800 of them. They were ready to volunteer, happy to go and die, to, to liberate their areas. I tried with the government in Baghdad to... Uh, to train them and arm them. And they were, most of them were, uh, were Sahwa before, you know, the awakening. Uh, but they had gone, you know, because they weren't paid and all that. And these poor people, they stayed there. I got them a camp in Leyland, like you said. Uh, they stayed there for months. No salary, no weapon, no training, nothing. And finally, this, they disbanded, actually. You know, at one time, Hashid Shaabi said they will help them, you know, the Shia militias. Nobody really helped them, you know. So uh, there is no con organized effort uh, how to make these people to fight for their own land. They are willing to do it. Actually, now that some have gone, you know, Tikrit has been liberated and Beji has been liberated, some have gone from uh, the west side trying to come this way. But still, they don't have any say in when that, when things happen. It's... It's all up to others, and they don't have a say, but they are willing to really do it. And we tried. I, I informed uh, the uh, US embassy about this. I informed the prime minister about this. I, worked, I talked to everybody I could. I well, let me, let me answer the lady's question. Well, uh, uh, you know, there, there's presidential law. 
uh, that uh, uh, outlines the president's term, two terms. Uh, uh, when uh, the last time the question came up, uh, PUK and KDP uh, uh, agreed uh, to, you know, it was necessary for Mr. Barzani to serve two more years. Uh, and at, during that two years, uh, the president's, the law for the presidency had to go to the parliament uh, uh, to uh, decide uh, how the president is elected, what are the presidential authorities. And fortunately, the parliament didn't, come, didn't take up that question until uh, very late. And then the president uh, wanted, he called for elections, uh, but it was not possible to have elections by the time the letter was sent to the election commission. Uh, there was not enough time. Uh, so the thing stayed. I think the parties approached this in a way uh, that made it difficult. Uh, I think this issue should have been uh, resolved in the parliament. Uh, because after all, it has, you have to have a law for these things, and parties cannot pass laws. It's the parliament that can pass laws. Uh, uh, there are efforts now to resolve the, uh, the issue. Uh, uh, as far as the, how the president is elected, uh, you know, once you have presidential powers uh, outlined uh, and what the president can do and what Council of Ministers and Parliament and Judiciary and all that, then it's really not important how the president is elected because the powers are very clear. I personally think that president should be elected by people. I think governors should be elected by people. We have that uh, system here and it, it's working fine. Uh, I mean, we have the strongest uh, presidential system in the world in this country, but still the president cannot do everything. I mean, we have seen that. We see that every day. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, not allowing the parliament speaker and evicting the, uh, the ministers, I think that's very unfortunate. Uh, I mean, the prime minister can resign, and that way the whole cabinet is considered resigned. But, you know, it shouldn't be, a, you know, a party should not uh, take the job of prime minister and decide on that. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will be resolved and uh, uh, the speaker goes back. You can always re-elect a new speaker, take uh, that thing away. It, it can be done, and we have to get away from this tension. And no, it hasn't affected the Peshmerga. They're fine. Okay. Uh, the gentleman in the front row and uh, the gentleman at the very back. Jenks Agnes from Moshe Dayan Center in Tel Aviv. I'm actually following very closely your policies in Kirkuk, and I've lived in Kirkuk for a while. Uh, my question would be, Kirkuk as the, as the province is most important for the PUK in the Kurdistan region, as the possible annexation of Kirkuk to the Kurdistan region could have changed the balance of uh, the political power in the region. Uh, in favor of the PUK, as it's the third party now, but in the possible annexation of Kirkuk and get me on to the, to, to the, to the region, uh, your party could be could become the first party in Kurdistan and uh, easily overthrew uh, the KDP-dominated government. Um, and you have this impression that you're trying to uh, have some kind of a semi-autonomous Kirkuk region. So do you think in the future there can be a, a conflict between you and your party and you become you, you as the uh, governor of Kirkuk who wants Kirkuk to be a semi-autonomous region while your, your party has the potential to want it to be an act to Kirkuk, Kurdistan? Thank okay. you. When were you in Kirkuk? Well, uh, in Kurdistan. Sorry, uh, Mr. Governor, can we take one more yeah, question? Yes, please. Um, my question's on Kirkuk. Um, what I heard was quite interesting. So Kirkuk is becoming the happy middle ground between the KRG and Baghdad for foreign investors. I know we're early days, but Iraq as an economic story is really interesting. I was there as a unified country because you have everything. You know, Basra's open for business, was doing quite well. Airbill's quite advanced, but there's structural difficulties because of its autonomous and not cooperation with the central state. If you're an Airbill, you have problems with Baghdad. You haven't been able to do Baghdad, business in Baghdad for over six years. It's the most hostile environment for business. But Kirkuk sounds like you're nice, peaceful, quiet, and you have the best of both worlds at this point, and probably including Basra. Is that correct, sir, Governor? Yeah, well, uh, actually, 
Basra, unfortunately, is, is not doing so well. Uh, uh, if uh, Basra has had uh, uh, a lot of petrodollar money, uh, but uh, you know they haven't they haven't done very well, and uh, uh, there's a lot of squabble between the political parties there, uh, and I think that's the main reason for the dysfunction that you have there. Uh, but they want to be a region by themselves because they think they have a lot of, and rightfully so, they have a lot of resources. And if they are a region by s themselves, then they can uh, manage it better. I'm sure it will be better than the way it is in Baghdad. As far as Kirkuk is concerned, I think uh, as long as this ISIS thing is there, people will be afraid, you know, uh, uh, capital is coward, you know. If, uh, if you have money, you want to do it in a safe place and all that. It is safe, the city and all that. But we still have those people. We have to get them out of there. And uh, uh, once that happens, yes, Kirkuk will be very receptive to a lot of investments. And we try to make their job easy, actually. However, you know, whenever we're allowed by law to do that. Um, your question about uh, uh, PUK, Kirkuk, uh, yes, uh, 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 PUK is very strong in Kirkuk. Uh, our the list in uh, the PUK list uh, won six out of 12 uh, seats in the parliament. And actually, if it wasn't for the quotas and all that, probably would have had nine or 10. Uh, it, it, it's very obvious. But I don't think that is uh, that has an impact on uh, uh, Kirkuk joining the Kurdistan region or staying out of it or uh, becoming a, a region by itself. Uh, both President Talabani and Barzani, when they have visited Kirkuk, of course, uh, Mr. Barzani visited Kirkuk after, you know, the, uh, most recently, they have always said the future of Kirkuk is, depends on the uh, citizens of Kirkuk. They have to decide that. And my personal opinion is you have to prepare the grounds for any eventuality. Uh, to me, Kirkuk is Kurdistan, but not Every, not every Kurdish city or Kur not every place in Kurdistan is part of KRG. You know, you have Kobani, you have Kermanshah, you have uh, Diyarbakir. They are not uh, part of KRG. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Kirkuk, uh, we have, like I said, we have to prepare the grounds for it. How do we do that? Uh, for those who really like to, for Kirkuk to join the Kurdistan region, obviously it has advantage. It's more secure, it's more prosperous. Uh, you know, it's a big difference between KRG and, and, and the rest of Iraq. Uh, but you also have people there that are not all Kurds. It's not like Erbil or Suleimania or, so you have to prepare the people for it. And I have asked the parliament speaker and the officials in the Kurdistan region, you have some uh, laws written in the parliament about the future of Kirkuk once the people vote on joining the Kurdistan region. What are the rights of the Turkmens? What are the rights of the uh, Arabs? How do they participate in the presidency, in the council of ministers? In the, uh, I think these are very important. People, if you just tell them, come and vote, vote uh, yes or no, that's, they may not even vote, actually. But if you give them hope and options and some reassurance that once that vote is towards joining Kurdistan region, I think people will vote for that. And I tell you, uh, that election we had last year showed that because we did get votes from Arabs and Turkmens. Because they, you know, it's, it's a matter of trust, but you can't just, if, if we have a referendum tomorrow, you say, we, oh no, Article 140 says a referendum. Okay, let's have a referendum. 50.01 votes for joining the Kurdistan region and 49.9 .9 votes against it. What do you gain by that? You get a Kirkuk that's divided, never safe, never, uh, never works. So you have to prepare the grounds for it. Uh, I think Kirkuk will benefit from joining Kurdistan region. Uh, but I think you also have, if you cannot do this, Article 140 and 58 before that in the TAL agreement, has been there since 2004. So how many years? 11 years plus. And it has stayed the same way. Nothing has happened. Isn't it better 
to take some of the, some, you know, to have Kirkuk decentralized and not to have Baghdad control everything, and do it for a transitional period, and maybe people will see that and uh, and then we'll say, okay, well this this is working well, and and then you go to a referendum, whatever it is, but you have to do some work in the Kurdistan region. It doesn't come by just talking about it. We have a question from the overflow room. Uh, is a very specific question. Is Kirkuk getting two dollars per each barrel produced? We are supposed to get five dollars, <laughs> according to uh, the law that was passed in the parliament. Actually, at that time when we were discussing this, we were the most proponent of increasing the petrodollar from one. But I suggested it should be by five five percent, not five dollars. You know because. You could see now, it, you know, five dollars in forty-five. You know, that's ten percent, more than ten percent. Uh, but anyway, uh, they haven't paid anything. Uh, we haven't received any money from our petrodollars of 2013 that we were supposed to get in 15, and 2014 that we were supposed to get this year. We have not received any. Uh, and of course, part of our oil since July of last year is being exported by the Kurdistan region, and they owe us money, too. So I hope the answer was. So let's get one more round of questions. The gentleman here and there, please. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ahmed Ali with the Education for Peace in Iraq Center. Governor, it's very good to see you. Thank you. Uh, you outlined the significance of Kirkuk in the fight against ISIS and also uh, for the future stability of Iraq. What do you think the U.S. government should do to support the stability and peace in Kirkuk? Uh, you know, when ISIS came, uh, and after they took Mahmoud, and they were close to Erbil, President Obama came out and, you know, made the statement about protecting Baghdad and Erbil, uh, because there were American citizens there, an embassy there, and a consulate there. And what I did, I co contacted uh, the ambassador, and I contacted some of my friends here. I said, we're really anxious in Kirkuk, you know, uh, because ISIS, uh, you know, Kirkuk is a much bigger price for ISIS than actually Erbil is uh, because of, of its wealth. Uh, and that uh, uh, we hope that this was just a public statement, but in reality we will be. And actually it took a while for... Uh, for the U.S. Air Force uh, or Coalition Air, uh, uh, Air Force uh, to start working in Kirkuk. But that's very important to keep, to keep that, and I think it's important to pay special attention to, uh, to the Peshmergas there, uh, make sure they are uh, better trained, uh, equipped. Uh, and also I have brought up the point of uh, this is really important, it can be an example for other governorates as well, the police. Our police is not receiving anything from Baghdad, except their salaries, no, nothing uh, at all. And you have, uh, you know, a, a police that has, you know, a good mixture of uh, all the eth ethnic groups in it. And it has done a good job, paid heavy prices. They have done a good job overall. Uh, and if you, uh, because this uh, uh, National Guard thing is not gonna work. Uh, you know, the, the Shias are not going to accept that. And if they don't accept that, so what is better than having local police from people of Ramadi have their own police, but strong, give them everything. Same thing in Mosul, same thing in other places. And that's why uh, special attention should be paid to local police, particularly in these areas. Hi, um, Zachary Kyler from the CSIS Energy Program. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks that service provision is one of the keys to holding Kirkuk together. Um, do you perceive the decline in petroleum revenue as a threat to continued effective service uh, provision um, and damage to infrastructure like Beji and internal infrastructure inside of Kirkuk? Um, and if so, um, what can be done in the medium term to ensure that uh, service provision remains effective? Well, I mean, definitely, uh, you know, the, the budget, the lowering of oil prices uh, has basically paralyzed everything. You know, we have projects that's 80 percent 
finished, we can't complete it. Uh, we have some even 90%, 95%. We can't complete it if you don't have fund. So what that does, it's the project is not completed. You will need more money once you start again, as you know. Uh, you know, people uh, don't have jobs when there are no uh, construction work going on. Uh, how do you do? How do you uh, cure that? I think uh, uh, we have to have real reforms, not uh, just uh, cutting down some salaries and uh, some uh, uh, cosmetic things. You have to go to the real reform. You have to, f to get rid of corruption. You know, the corruption is still rampant. Uh, in uh, in all of Iraq, actually including the uh, Kurdistan regional government. Uh, these things have to be dealt with. Uh, people have to feel they are part of this government, not uh, have so much gap uh, between uh, the very rich. I, I mean, in Iraq, you have so many oligarch. I don't know what they call them in Arabic. Uh, but there is, there is really. Uh, I mean, people, everybody knows. I mean, there was nothing, and all of a sudden, just lifestyle, everything has changed. Uh, and, and, and I think that's really, the, the, that's the most important thing. I think once people feel there is corruption and all that, they don't feel the government is there, they don't feel they have to sacrifice for anything. But if you get rid of that, and there's a perception that corruption is being fought and bad people are, uh, you know, whatever they do with them, try them, put them in jail, or just dismiss them from their job. I think people will cooperate with the government, and and even if there is no money, I think uh, uh, they will manage. They will have trust, and gradually things will uh, will be rebuilt again. There was a question there, and I think we have just a few more minutes for a few more questions. Yes, please. No. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'll come to you. Sorry. <laughs> As we know, the Hajj al-Shaabi, they acting as an Iraqi army now. They are in the south, around the area south of Kirkuk. You don't believe after removing Daesh in the area, Hajj al-Shaabi will be another tiger force for the area. As you mentioned, tiger area, what they did, they want to uh, control the area and everywhere. Or in other way, conflict, it's gonna be conflict between Peshmerga and Hajj al-Shaabi in the future. Thank you. Do you want me to answer? Let's, let's take one more question. Uh, Phoebe Marr, historian of Iraq. I, I would like actually to follow up a little on what this gentleman asked and especially your exchange with, with Michael on this issue of who um, liberates, let's use that term, the ISIS-held areas, who holds them? secures them afterward, and who gets to live in them? You mentioned specifically the, the numbers of, of Arabs you have in your, your territory who wanted to fight in their own area and so on, and said nothing is happening. You talk to the, you know, it's a, it's a problem, of, it looks like a problem of mismanagement. But I'd like to ask you why that's not happening. It isn't, and I, I think for those of us that, that must deal with this issue of the day after and, and what's happening. Let's take Salah al-Din. Um, people are not going back because of mistrust or whatever it is. Who, who is going to retake that area, secure it? And, and you mentioned knowing all these people, who, who they are. Who gets to come back and why aren't they going back? Could you follow up, please, on, on this, what I just said? Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, well, it's both. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my best, Phoebe. Uh, as far as uh, tension with Hashid Shaabi, there is already tension in Tuskhurmatu area. Uh, there is. Uh, uh, you have to remember that uh, the Shia militias are not one. There are so many of them. Uh, I think the only the only ones who can control them are the Iranians. That's why U.S. You know, I'm hoping after this nuclear deal agreement, there will be some coordination on how uh, to do this because nobody else can control them. You know, everybody is on their own. Um, the people uh, who controls those areas, who hold those areas, uh, the truth is 
uh, most of those places has been uh, Tikrit, uh, Beji, uh, almost all parts in Diyala, and then that road that goes from uh, Tushurma to to, uh, to Salah Adin province towards Tikrit has all been uh, cleared by Hashid Shaabi, by the Shia militias, all. And, and actually, it's up to them who goes back, who doesn't go back. Because I, I know, for example, in Kirkuk, uh, I got a call from the governor. They will send buses to take families back. But then they had names. Names. And actually, few buses went back empty, even though there were people who wanted to go back. I don't know if that answers you. Yeah. Uh, question there and another one from here and Final outcome. My name is Said Reza. I am with the HDP, People's Democratic Party of Turkey. Uh, good to see you, Dr. Kerim. Nice to see you. Uh, my question is, uh, you said that uh, Kerkük is not protecting by Iraqi army, but the Peshmerge. And uh, the president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, calls PYD of uh, Rojava, uh, they are more dangerous than ISIS. And uh, so uh, what is your relation with Rojava and uh, PYD? And what, do you, what is your comment about that ISIS is not as dangerous as uh, uh, PYD? Sorry, let's take Thank two you. more, uh, Marwan and I don't know if you will take a question from the peanut gallery. Um, you mentioned you have a massive humanitarian crisis on your hand in the city of Kirkuk, and KRG has also been making these calls to the international community. With the financial crisis that Iraq as a whole is facing, what plans do you have in, in place or initiatives to help alleviate with this crisis? And two, what is your message for Washington on the IDP crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me answer the last question first. Uh, uh, as far as uh, the humanitarian crisis, uh, this is something the Iraqi government cannot uh, do it by itself. It's just uh, when you have three million uh, IDPs with no money, no cash, uh, so it needs really uh, concerted international help. And I think here comes uh, uh, the, you know, the reason for the Europeans uh, to help on this. Why are you having all these people going to Europe? I think if you provide uh, an environment where these people can feel like they can live decently and have their children go to school and all that, you may prevent that. And, and I think that's something that the, uh, the, European, the European Parliament and all that has to pick up and, and be more uh, helpful. Uh, I know, uh, as far as Kirkuk is, is concerned, uh, their humanitarian uh, help has been uh, five million uh, uh, euros. Uh, I don't know if it has come yet or not, uh, but that's all. Uh, so they need to increase their help, and actually, all of uh, uh, European Union has paid very, given very little actually to. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, internally displaced people uh, in Iraq. That, that's really a tragedy, you know. Uh, but, but the best thing is for the Iraqi government, uh, the U.S., and everybody else to work on getting the people to go back to their homes. Once they go back to their homes, there's no other solution. These are all just Band-Aid treatment. The, the, the solution is for these people to go back to their places. You know, it will alleviate uh, uh, tensions, uh, even the same ethnic group, the same sect, if they mix and they think you're taking something away from them that belongs to them, there will be tension between them, let alone in places where you have a mixture of these. It, uh, so it can explode one day. Uh, I mean, uh, that's a reality. Uh, as far as uh, <coughs> PYD is concerned, uh, 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 I think PYD is doing a great job fighting ISIS. Uh, PYD is not worse than ISIS. PYD uh, is a liberating force. Uh, they have uh, uh, 
uh, paid heavy price for the places that they have taken. And I just like to remind everybody from the areas that's uh, controlled by PYD and liberated by them, not a single act against Turkey has happened. It's ISIS that's going to Ankara and blowing themselves up. It's ISIS that's going to Diyarbakir and to Suruj. It's not PYD. And I think uh, I'm hoping that uh, this opinion will change. Uh, we have seen changes happen before. Uh, I remember at one time very high tension between the KRG and Turkey, even until 2007. But then things changed and has improved. I hope the same thing will happen there. Okay, we, unfortunately, we have time only for one more question. So the gentleman over here has been waiting patiently. Uh, actually, Uh, I'm Heyman Hasseini from Rojalat. My question is regarding Turkish foreign policy uh, towards Iraq and in particular Kirkuk. Uh, as we know, uh, the PKK fighters uh, played a constructive role in liberating Mahmur, Guer, some parts of Shangal, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, defending Kirkuk. So this being said, and now uh, we know that Turkey uh, it is five months that they have started. Uh, uh, ha they have started airstrikes against the PKK camps in uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan, unfortunately. And this being said, and on the other hand, Tur uh, Kirkuk has a noticeable uh, Turkmen population. How do you assess the the Turkish role in uh, uh, security of uh, Kirkuk, people of Kirkuk? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the Turkmen population of Kirkuk are Iraqis. Uh, uh, as far as Turkey is concerned, uh, I have uh, seen and met with uh, high-ranking Turkish officials. Uh, I hope uh, this flare-up in the fightings that started uh, before this last election will end. Turkish government was uh, negotiating with the PKK. Uh, I think the parliament should uh, pick up this issue. Uh, it's actually this government itself uh, changed things in Turkey that wasn't there before. So we're hoping that uh, this was all election cycle that led to this and it will be uh, reversed and negotiation will start. That's the only solution because uh, PKK, you know, Turkey cannot eliminate PKK. PKK cannot eliminate the Turkish army. Uh, the only way is is peace, and uh, we hope that that will happen. Uh, as far as our relationship with the uh, uh, Turkish government, I have met all high-level officials, and uh, uh, they haven't, uh, actually, they have been uh, supportive of our efforts in Kirkuk. I'm happy to say that. Well, so let's end on that happy note, and please join me in thanking Mr. Governor. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you.